Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to the Safina Society podcast. Uh, today we're joined by a few people. We have uh, different side at the controls. Apparently all our audio Control guys are Saad. named Saad. <laughs> um, we have, of course, Dr. Shadi. Um, Nazmul, who's been here before. We also have a first-time guest, uh, Ahmed Naim. Critical. He's a North Jersey OG. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have a very special guest, Dr. Jonathan Brown. Uh, Dr. Brown is uh, the chair of the Al Walid bin Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization at Georgetown University. He's also the director of the uh, Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown and a professor at Georgetown. You previously were a professor in Seattle, University of Washington. University of Washington, yeah. yeah. And uh, Dr. Brown's uh, background is uh, mainly in, or his, his, uh, his graduate work was hadith, hadith criticism, authenticity, and historicity of the hadith corpus. Um, he's written a number of books, um, including Misquoting Muhammad, so, uh, they so, well, so well, the Challenges and well. Choice of Interpreting the Prophetic Legacy, uh, Muhammad, a very short introduction, and uh, Hadith, Muhammad's Legacy in, medieval in, in, in the Medieval and Modern World, as well as his thesis was published as a book as well. Was it? No, not yet. Yeah, the, the canonization of Abu Khari. Yeah, that was, that was but not idea. for purchase. It's brill. So it, it is for purchase. Three hundred and forty-six dollars. If you have one hundred eighty-one dollars, <laughs> I think the paperback <laughs> paperback is only sixty dollars. So welcome to New Jersey, Dr. Brown. Yeah. Hmm. I said welcome to New Jersey and welcome My to the pleasure. podcast. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. And we and we missed the last book. Well, maybe it's not in the bio yet. Oh, the slavery, slavery in Islam. Book. What is it yeah. called? Just slavery in Islam. Slavery in Islam. Yeah. It originally, it had a sort of a subtitle, but then I realized because it wasn't really about everything about slavery in Islam but then I realized that by the end of the book it was pretty comprehensive so I said yeah. I don't want to just say slavery in Islam so your first point and your main point I th uh, my takeaway is that pretty much one of the biggest points in your whole career is this idea that the way a regular smart person throughout the world and throughout history would analyze history and to do something to be a historical fact that we can reliably transmit uh, the western critical method right the western historical critical method has some assumptions oh, in addition to what any regular intelligent person would do. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would go further and I would just say that there is no, there is no person, regular intelligent person in history transhistorically. There is not, there's no such thing as one way that a intelligent human being would think throughout history. What people, assess history though? Yeah, people are products of their environment. But you don't think that there are certain criterion that come together that give people a sense that yes this thing this transmission of a fact is true so we should pass it on as history right or this record right uh has certain qualities right such as that it comes from four different people or something like that that we can accept this document as reflecting history not fact not fiction i mean i think that the probably the more uh witnesses you have to something directly the more likely any human community is to believe it but i i think that uh human societies are so idiosyncratic in some things that it's they... funny because i was just having this talk with uh some man yunus online and uh Waqar because what i said was that i do believe that there are certain things that from the dawn of time until the end of time the way our intellects are put together there are certain forms of logic. There are certain conditions of accepting facts and rejecting facts that are going to be universal, right? right. That if I threw you a mm -hmm. 3,000 years ago into India, there is going to be, in the way your brain works and the way regular intelligent person in that society works, there's going to be overlap. But you're talking about, now you're talking about the way your brains work and logic. That's very different from history. I mean, if you said, for example, principle of non-contradiction, yeah. if you said uh, sort of just basic reliance on sense perception, immediate sense perception. You don't you, think that history also uh, is involved in that? Because uh, if I went to India 3,000 years ago and I went to a man and I said, uh, the hut's going to burn down. And he says, who said? Right, or the hut's burning down. He's, he's, he goes to me, who said? And I said, well, um, a, a four-year-old said it. He's going to keep doing what he's doing. But if I tell him, no, 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 uh, your uncle or your aunt or your brother, an adult, told me the hut's burning down, he's going to take it seriously. I don't, yeah, but I think that could be, you go to another society where people think of children as innocent and uncorruptible and, and that children will always tell the truth because they haven't been corrupted by all the foibles of society. And so when they say, 
you know, this is, I think you can even see in um, of some movies and TV shows today, the idea that, you know, when a child comes up and tells you something, that they, there's some kind of truthfulness in that. They're not, there's no artifice. Yeah. So I think but that, you get the idea that, that. No, yeah, but I, I get that. I, ch I challenge in the idea. I mean, I think that, okay. I think so. that you, you, your assumption about, you just yeah. said this guy wouldn't listen to the four-year-old. I'm saying, I think that there are societies have been in our societies where they yeah. would take the four-year-old's opinion. So seriously. is there, uh, what are the absolutes? Okay, that we could say exists over the past, you know, maybe thousand or two thousand years in the transmission of history that you would say that we can take as the default, mm. right? And then here are the assumptions that you're claiming or you're stating, your assertion is that exists in the Western historical method. So, I mean, I would say that, I, I mean, this might seem like an academic distinction, but I think it's important to distinguish between statements you make about uh, epistemo sort of epistemological assertions. Yeah. So to say that uh, certainty can come from X or from Y. Mm -hmm. And then there's there's also the fact that, uh, for example, I mean, th the rule of law of gravity. Mm -hmm. Does a law of gravity exist epistemologically out there in the world, ontologically out there in the world? Or is it just a really good way of observe of describing things that generally happen, but it might not be true. Like right now, the, what we've all just seen as the rule of gravity might just stop working because mm -hmm. it's just that's stopped working. And then our description, our heuristic or description would no longer be valid. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's a the difference between how we look at the, the way knowledge comes to us. So I would say that just in terms of how human beings, and I, by the way, I think this is mostly how Muslim scholars epistemologically looked at this issue is they were not so much interested in theoretical uh, assertions as they were, and certainly in things like testimony from the past, as, as they were in descriptions of how uh, people generally function. So they would, the n notion of tawatur, of, you know, sometimes called massive parallel transmission or massively transmitted reports, uh, the usulis would say that things like the existence of China. So who's been to China? Anybody? Yeah. Oh yeah, the businessman's been. In China. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's been to Antarctica? In Antarctica? I have not kidding. Oh, okay, a few. So I mean, we we actually don't know if Antarctica exists or not. Mm -hmm. We have no. This is the classic example in the school yeah. books is like Wujud uh, Sleen, right? Yeah. Wujud uh, Sleen. So, um, like, we could just say Antarctica. The existence of that, the existence of George Washington. There was a guy named George Washington. None of us met him. None of us ever saw him. We've seen pictures and things like that. There's no videotape of him. So like that kind of thing would be certain in the past yeah. because it's simply it's just inconceivable to us that someone could make this that make up that massive of forgery and no intelligent generation will come along and expose it yeah i mean it would years. be but you know then it there's did you see this movie interstellar yeah yeah it was one of my favorites actually you liked it a lot yeah i loved it okay well i mean it's an okay movie i mean look, I'm, I'm happy you liked it, I'm happy you liked it okay? uh, so remember the scene when i thought this was really interesting when he goes into the school and he's they said, you know, they like the moon, like we all know the moon landing was. Oh, famous, that was right? hilarious. Because that, that, that scene was great. That's a really good scene for Muslims, yeah. I think, because you're, you know. That you, describes our. Yeah, I mean, that, that's basically, regularly. that just shows like, look, you know what? Things that are, what's common sense and certain and everybody knows this, that yeah. stuff actually isn't the same everywhere and all in all times. Yeah. It can change even in one society. Uh, so, and then you look at so the way people talk about gender issues or about sexual sexuality, about social mores, things that everybody knows are true now is not, wasn't even true 20 years ago. Yeah. So I think like this is a, a good way to, um, I, I think it's very important because it shows, it, it helps Muslims and I think it helps everybody in society break out from this feeling that uh, the way that we determine truth has to be the way that everybody determined it in the past. Okay. So then what is, did you have something to say, Elias? What are uh, the Western assumptions that you referenced? So the the first of all, I want to say that the the discussion that uh, Dr. Shadi is, is talking about is the chapter nine of my book. I think it's chapter nine, a uh, book on Hadith, the mm -hmm. new edition, uh, Hadith Muhammad's legacy in the medieval modern world, from one world. And uh, the uh, so there's a section on the Western study of Hadith. In the beginning, it starts out with a just you know maybe ten or fifteen page description of the origins and development of the Western historical critical method. So how how do Western scholars um, why do they look at the history the way they do? Why do they look at religion the way they do? The way that why do they think about the origins of religion history the, the way they do? 
um, when they read a, when when an American reads a book of a description of the past, uh, why is it that they sort of guffaw at some stuff and believe other things? And uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I think that uh, you want me to like describe. Yeah, give us a things? summary. Give the listeners. Okay, I'll summary. give the li- listeners yeah. a summary. Yeah, it's, Good thing I read it yesterday in the train. I mean, <laughs> as I'd be up a creek. People, people don't read anymore, so this will be beneficial to them. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the the so basically the the main sources. So first of all, it's, it's important to know that people uh, don't drop out of the womb thinking like a 20th century American or 20th century British person about the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is uh, the way we think of, and I say we here, we Western people, right? The way we think about the past is product of a very specific cultural tradition, very specific religious tradition, very specific technological tradition. Um, and uh, so the, the, basically the, what we call historical critical method, which would be the way that Western scholars kind of evaluate what is true and false about the past, or it reports about the past, uh, comes from a couple major sources. It's shaped by the Renaissance rediscovery of uh, Greco-Roman legacy. Mm-hmm. It's shaped by uh, the Protestant Reformation. Mm-hmm. It's shaped by the Age of Discovery, especially the discovery of the Americas. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's pretty much it, right? So uh, these these forces uh, are what create our view of the world. Mm. Um, and the way so each of these each of these different forces has its own effect. So just for example the uh let's start with something like the age of discovery so until 1492 uh the 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 map of the globe was based on kind of ptolemy and strabo kind of uh, greco-roman uh uh uh, imagination of how the continent continents looked and of course there's no americas there's just you see a, a flat picture, but they didn't think the world was flat. They just thought there was nothing on the other side of the globe, which is the ocean. Mm. So, and then that gets affirmed by the the, the church, the Christian, the, the, the Christian church, and um, then the kind of history of humanity is based on the the kind of biblical genealogy, the the story of Genesis and things like that, and uh, a kind of a overall conception of history that is kind of uh, formalized by people like Saint Augustine. You know. Uh, there's the Adam and Eve, and then humans fall, and then uh, uh, there's prophets and things like that. And then uh, the peak of history is the moment in which the divine has this contact with the earth in the person of Jesus. And then everything goes downhill from there until the end of time when it gets really bad, and then it'll get really good, and then, it, you know, whatever happens, the end of the world yeah. happens. I mean, that should sound familiar because this is actually a kind of Muslim view. It's an Abrahamic view of history, except for Muslims, it's the the moment of the Quran is the mm-hmm. peak. Um, so the just think about when you when you discover the Americas, they don't fit into this. Yeah. Like, oh, where are this? Where is this in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. Yeah. Or where is this in the church's official geography? It's not in the official geography. Where are the people of the Bible? Uh, the people of the Americas. Who are they, who are they descended from? Yeah. And uh, so this one guy in the late 1600s, a scholar named Isaac de la Perere, he's a French scholar. He has this. He wrote a book called the the pre Adamites, mm-hmm. and he says that. Um, so it's actually interesting in the book of Genesis. So when Cain murders Abel, it's interesting. He just he, he runs away and he marries from another tribe, mm-hmm. which if you think about it, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like wait wait a second. I thought like Adam and Eve, and then there's Cain and Abel. It turns out there's like some other. So actually, um, based on that, and then just this notion that there's these other parts of the world that no one had known about before, uh, Isaac de la Perere says. The Bible is a local story. It's not a global story. So this is not the story of humanity. This is actually the story of just one tribe. And, and there's other things out there that aren't being described. Um, well, previously to that, how did they explain China? There's no reference to China or India in the Bible. Um, Why wouldn't they just apply that? No, but these explanation? were. The, but these are. Yo, I know. They no, actually they're they would they have a descent from Noah. So Noah's different sons, Yaphet so they and say Ham, Ham and all oh, these other people. So okay. there's so there his different sons go well, and settle these yeah. areas, right? Okay. So um, the that, that's just a, that's just sort of the age of discovery. Yeah. And then you, you let so let's look at like Protestant Reformation. So Protestant Reformation breaks the interpretive control of the Bible. Yeah. So the the, the idea that who can study the Bible. 
um, what kind of claims we made about the Bible. It's not just being made by the church anymore. Mm. It's being made by all these different Protestant groups. And some of these Protestant groups are pretty extreme in their views. And so you look, uh, um, you know, I sort of, sort of back up a little bit for the, to the first cause, which I should have gone to first, which is the rediscovery of the Greco-Roman tradition mm -hmm. and the, from the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, which they get from Muslims, they get from Byzantine Empire, uh, the books of Aristotle, books of Plato, the uh, history of Livy, the letters of Cicero. Basically, uh, it, if you looked at, let's say, a, a Renaissance prince, or not prince, a medieval European prince in 1200, or a scholar or a medieval monk in 1200, right? They just saw themselves a direct continuation of the Roman tradition. Um, you know, like a Frankish version of it, but they were the same church. They were, they were a direct continuation of the past. They didn't see a rupture between themselves and the past and the Roman past. Yeah. So if you go to, you know, these, um, uh, like a chapel of a, of, a, of a church or something, it would have a painting of biblical figures in the clothing of a, 12th century German peasants mm. or you'd see the uh, you know the, the prince in the the clothing of a, of a Roman senator Roman knight or something like that right so there's just a, there's no notion of historical distance now what happens when they discover these writings of Cicero and things like that is they just, as they realize how Cicero is a you know Roman senator and Redder, man about town, man of letters, dies in uh, 43 BC, executed in 43 BC. So he, uh, they realized how much the Latin had changed. It's really about the study of change in language. They realized that the language, the Latin they're speaking, mm. and the church Latin of the 1300s is just this totally corrupt, decadent mm. version. It's not this like clean, pure Latin of Cicero. And then they start realizing that some documents, there's this document called the Donation of Constantine, which is supposedly made by the Emperor Constantine. He died, what was it, uh, 338 or something like that? I can't remember exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And he, before he dies, a, allegedly he writes this donation where he basically gives control of many of the lands of the, of the Latin West to the church. And this is one of the many justifications that the papacy uses for temporal control. Mm -hmm. And so this scholar uh, named Lorenzo Valla in the 1400s, he dies about uh, in the mid 1400s, and uh, he, he studies this, his study of, he's a scholar of Latin, and he realizes there's words in this document that didn't exist at the time of Constantine. Uh, so, yeah. you know, and like- And yet they're in the letter. Yeah, exactly, so- Which is the, which is the basis, yeah. yeah, which is the basis of the Catholic Church's- is Well, one of the bases, yeah. Their, their property, basically. So it's one, of, yeah, yeah, it's one of the, I mean, so he-, he And know, legitimacy and authority, et cetera. So he's like, this is a, this is a forgery. And then, of course, the next generation, a guy named uh, Desiderius Erasmus, who died 1536, a very famous scholar from Rotter Rotterdam. There's a font named after him, by the way. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. I'm Erasmus. glad. Uh, <laughs> well, that's all of our connection to Erasmus. Uh, so the, um, he basically, he kind of does the same thing for Greek. So he gets, he actually wants to reconstruct this, the early, the actual original Greek text of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So he gets a lot of early manuscripts and he realizes for example there's this book verse 1 john uh 5 uh through 7 i think it's called the johannan comma it says in english it says there there are three who bear testament in the heavens the father the word and the holy spirit and these three are one um so that's the only which is the trinity verse. yeah that's the yeah. only explicit discussion of the trinity that's what in uh, the New testament um, a lot of uh people put all over like like in, on themselves, like tattoo it games. on themselves. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I've always like, wondered. What does you know, it say? John one dash it's one colon John, five. One John. Uh, somebody look it up. Uh, five colon Johann, three. Johann in common. So comma. Yeah. So Johann in comma. So the uh, basically that he realized this isn't actually in the early manuscripts. Really? It's a later edition. Wow. So then I mean that's their whole. Aqidah so then he right gets there. really attacked. So he gets <laughs> very. He get he he says basically okay. He's getting, a, this is like, you know, Twitter, Twitter awards. He gets Twitter award, right? <laughs> and he says, okay, you know, if someone can give me an early Greek manuscript yeah. that has this, I'll put it back in my edition. So, okay, and some, so, someone comes up with a, you know, quote unquote version with it. And so, he concedes, yeah. Hold on a second. So let's backtrack. Erasmus is who exactly? Erasmus, when, when is he living? Erasmus died in 1536. So died in 1536. These guys, Where these is guys he living? Are, he's from, originally from Rotterdam. Which is? He, 
It's in the Netherlands. The Netherlands. So he okay. lives in. He moves around. He lives in. These guys are like Muslim scholars, right? So they they he goes and lives in England for a while. He hangs okay. out with Thomas More. He goes and lives in France and Switzerland, all over the place. So he's in the era of right after the Protestant Revolution. No Reformation. He's he's an interesting guy because his life spans both the discovery of the Americas and the Protestant Reformation. Okay, interesting. So, okay, so he's a scholar of Latin and Greek. He's a scholar of language, of, language. of, of Latin and Greek. And, right? and who asked him to do what? He does the stuff on his own. On his own. He wants to do what? To he translate wants, the Bible? He wants to, he wants to find out the original versions of these texts. Okay. He wants to purify language. So he's working with what Bible? Greek? Uh, well, which Bible? So is he basically, with? what was being, what was used from roughly the. Um, Roughly the, the the fifth or sixth century onward mm -hmm. uh, uh, is the what's called the Latin Vulgate, which is produced by uh, Saint Jerome. Okay, so that's the, the Bible the he's century. in his between his hands. It's a lot. So the Latin Vulgate, yeah. So he wants to go and say, well, let's, that's let's not, look at the that, original one. Yeah. So that's not the original language of the New Testament or the yeah, Old right. Testament, right? Yeah. So it's the it's um uh it was in Greek and parts of it in, just, you know, one or two parts in Aramaic. But well, point, Greek is also the a second a translation. Well, the yeah, but Greek was what it was originally written in. Written in. Okay. I mean, it wasn't which is a translation. they weren't speaking. So it would be like if, you know, if I wrote an Arabic history, an Arabic history of our podcast, uh -huh. that would be like the, the New Testament. I so I'm, okay. I'm I'm trans I'm, I'm translating from our original language, but that that's my original my when I write this book, it's going to be in Arabic. So he gets he he gets a, a hold of the Greek version ver, uh, translation. Early of the book. early. So he one of the things that happens through in the Renaissance is this transmission, the actual discovery and transmission of texts from Muslims in Spain, mm -hmm. Muslims in Sicily. And the Byzantine Empire. So it's, it's also remember it's not a it's not a uh, coincidence that this starts in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s when Byzantine territory is shrinking dramatically mm -hmm. uh, uh, due to Ottoman expansion. So yeah. uh, Byzantine scholars, Greek speaking scholars, are just like sh flooding into the Latin West mm. with all their manuscripts and all their histories mm -hmm. and things like that. Also so, the Reconquista, yeah. right? Yeah, and the Reconquista. Yeah. So then he goes in and he's he's opening. He opens up. A Greek manuscript. Lots of Greek manuscripts. Lots of Greek manuscripts. And, and he start, doesn't find this main. Yeah, major you know, verse. another thing that's not in there, by the way, it's really, you know, the, the he who let he who, him who, uh, that he without sin cast, cast the, the first, first stone. stone. Oh, that's not in there. That's either. not in there. Who saw the movie The Passion? I did. I did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that in Egypt. It was really weird. How the hell did I see that in Egypt? How, I, you know, I saw it on some guy's laptop in an internet cafe. That was it. Those were the it must days, have been right? like 2000 or 2002 <laughs> yeah, was or like something. So then, yeah. but there's like that scene in the movie is like the coolest scene. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if you remember that scene, but I mean. That, so I didn't the, see it. So he, uh, you're very pure. My so this, uh, so this, uh, this scene's not in, so he even says like, this is a. This is a really great story, but yeah. it wasn't really part of the Bible. But he kept wow. it in because he was like, this is just an excellent story. Uh, so, but this, <laughs> Wait, so this is the only reference to the Trinity in the Bible. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to, I'm not a, a bit scholar of the Bible. No, I've and, actually, I've actually come across that that's the verse and yeah. there's no other reference. I've come across that. Like, yeah. In, so in this is, this is definitely, summaries. this is, yeah. I mean, I don't want, I, I, like as a matter of principle, I don't tell other religious traditions whether or not they've done a good job interpreting and understanding the scriptures. Yeah. But I mean, I, I think that it's pre fairly well established that this is the only explicit mention of the Trinity. Of the Trinity. Yeah. And, it, and he only finds it in the Latin Bibles and not in well, the Well, he Greeks. doesn't find it in the early Greek manuscripts. Not in an early Greek manuscript. Early Greek but manuscript. So, later Greek. Yeah, later so, Greek then, so then he ends up putting it in because again, he really got, you know, he got he got like Twitter, he got death, by, death by Twitter mob yeah. over this. And and how how are the, at that time? I'm just curious. How are they sharing their knowledge? Like for example, he discovers this. Does he write an essay, an epistle, saying yeah. I looked at this, 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 this? Well, he, pub he published there. a an edition of the New Testament. He published that edition, and that yeah. means that he's paying a scribe. I'm just trying to. Well, now the they have man, now they have printing press. Oh, he's in that oh, time. Right. Okay, that's yeah. True. So they can. So he publishes stuff. it. Yeah. Okay. In Latin. Uh, in, Greek, in, in Greek, in Greek, yeah. Okay, he publishes in Greek, and uh, he gets slammed by the scholars of his day for yeah. not including that verse. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's actually light. If someone published a Quran without Surah Al Ikhlas, he wouldn't get slammed. <laughs> he would be get preyed upon. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Or not preyed upon. <laughs> or not preyed upon. It was yeah. a mistake. Well, yeah. I didn't. He didn't mean. Yani, he meant yeah. yuqtal. Yuqtal. No, he's yeah. saying. 
يقتل ولا يصلى عليه. Yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. <laughs> so the you know this. Um, yeah. But you know that's the thing. I mean, just a little aside. I think like you know. Muslims are really hard on themselves, but you know, Muslims have a lot of ghira, ghira for their religion. They have a lot of jealousy yeah. and concern for their religion and for their book and for their prophet. And yeah. that's, that's, well, I remember listening to a, a, a radio show, you know, in Washington, the, um, uh, the Miami folks, they had a radio program. I didn't right? know that. Oh yeah, they did. They had a show. They had like a show and Dr. Uh, Nasser used to get interviewed like a couple times a week oh, okay. on that show. And one of the guys interviewed him and he said, you know, they Muslims and they, they, they accuse us of, of being angry for the prophet, peace be upon him and stuff. And Dr. Nasser said, I, a Catholic priest also uh, brought that up to me. And he said, uh, what are you going to tell your community? They get, keep uh, burning things down every time someone curses the prophet. He said, well, they're, we're very emotionally connected to our prophet. And if you find that, you know, that's different from your uh, followers that's really your followers' problem <laughs> why you couldn't transmit that love to to your followers yeah and actually, uh, you know yeah, no we are we are pretty hard on ourselves as Muslims but if you actually look at the way Muslims take religion yeah. compared to other religions like I obviously I travel a lot I must have gone to over 40 countries and I pray on the go so I've prayed at almost every major airport in the world that's crazy and all of them typically have prayer space yeah only used by Muslims. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I love it. They're, they're like it's like spiritual like space. Yeah. Yeah. The and there's like you know the some Belgium. like there's yeah. some like crystal power thing over in one corner, and then it's just all yeah. all prayer rugs. Yeah. Any time of day, I'm going there, and there will be Muslims in that. Like in Belgium, they have one for each religion. Yeah, they're empty. They're yeah. empty, but the, the Muslim one is, is packed. Packed, and, and we're talking in Belgium. It's not a Muslim country. Yeah. No, yeah. you you pass by these. There's always someone rolling down his pants. He just made wudu, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> and he's and he's mumbling. Call there. <laughs> and someone walks in uh two or four <laughs> so so, so now universities too yeah same thing so now you get to the point so these three so, things cast some kind of so, doubt so then about what, their so what happens is there's a couple of things so one is like the sense of distance like you start to see yourself as different from the past yeah. so instead of thinking of yourself as we're a continuation of the roman tradition you feel there's a break you see you see look you think look at for example, and this is something that there's a poet, a Latin poet named uh, Petrarch, yeah. died in 1374. He wrote a book, it isn't a lot of books, but one of them has been translated to English. It's called The Secret. Mm -hmm. It's actually really beautiful. I, I recommend uh, reading it. And um, he he talk, he realizes this Cicero, like this guy wasn't, you know, because of the, kind of the, the Christian, the classical Christian, uh, kind of the classics and Christian. Um, uh, reconciliation or, or or hybrid of the Middle Ages, where you know Aristotle and uh, Roman philosophy and all this stuff, or Roman logic, and this is like you know reconciled with Christianity. Yeah. That wasn't these guys weren't Christians. Like Cicero yeah. was not a Christian. Yeah. Right? Was a right? These guys were these guys were pagans. Yeah. And they not only that, but they had you know they they see they find in someone in Cicero this um, something you will recognize very very uh, quickly because it's we've inherited it from the Renaissance, which is this notion of um, Cicero was very publicly reverential towards Roman religion. You, you would like go out, you do the rituals, but back when you're talking with your friends, it's, it's all just silly. Yeah. You know? So there's that idea that you have public reverence. It's, it's like kind of like American politicians, right? They're yeah. publicly reverential, but in private, you know, everyone it's, this is all silly, silly yeah. stuff. Right. So the that, definition of a of monastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, <laughs> but, so the, but then, and so the that's another thing they discover in these texts is the the works of someone like Herodotus died for, around 420 BC, uh, a guy named uh, Polybius, a yeah. Greek historian writing in Rome and about Rome. He died around one I think 130 uh, BC, Polybius, and the they discovered the model of the historian not as a Christian chronicler, but as a kind of detached analyst. Yeah. So if you read, like, if you guys have read his, the Herodotus' histories, it's fascinating. So he talks about the Trojan War. He's like, Helen was never at Troy. Mm. Why? Who is going to fight 10 years? Like, they would just give the, like, okay, you know what? One year has gone by. Why don't you take Helen back? Yeah. You know, no big deal. Like, <laughs> it's just <laughs> like 10, 10 years. You don't fight for 10 years for yeah. this. So what this is very important. One thing uh, is this notion of human nature is a fixed 
uh, phenomenon, yeah. right? So that human beings, this is how the Greco-Roman view of history was it cyclical. There's no change in history. Yeah. Just the wheel of fortune goes round and round and round. Sometimes you go rich, sometimes you're poor. But humans are always the same. Mm. And that becomes a very important way of thinking about history that allows Western historians to go back and say, I know what happened in the past because people in the past were just like people now. Mm. If people now are greedy bastards who always just want whatever they want and trying to, you know, maximize their gain and all this stuff like that and they're cynical and nasty, that's what people were in the past. That's mm. very different from the way that Christians thought about the time of Jesus or yeah. Muslims think about the companions or the prophet lays outside. We don't think this. about the companions of like other people. Yeah. So um then the other thing to discover, as I said before, is the notion of the of the, the historian as the detached analyst. So someone like Tacitus, uh, who's a historian, it dies around one thirty of the Common Era, or Polybius, as I mentioned earlier. Polybius says that the job of the historian is to be he has to be ready to criticize his friends and praise his enemies. So you kind of the historian as the detached analyst. Yeah. So this stuff is all discovered for a couple of things come out of the Greco Roman tradition. One the idea that you go back and you discover these texts and you start to realize how much language has changed and how much texts have been doctored. Two, notion of historical distance, how we're really just different from the past. Yeah. Okay. Three, uh, the idea that there's a fixed human nature doesn't change over time. And four, uh, the notion of a historian writing as a kind of detached and sort of, I don't want to say supercilious, but almost um, kind of haughty, the historian is writing about, like, you know how people, if you go and go into his history section of a bookstore and you pick up a book it doesn't just talk about the past in a matter of fact way it's always making these kind of quips and jokes and things like that and this guy was so silly he did this, yeah. this was, it's almost a super silly attitude towards the past so I mean, go ahead Nazem. yeah so about this idea of uh, the historian being detached right if you read let's say like Muslim historians versus Herodotus or any of the Roman guys like Herodotus and these Roman guys they have a huge suspicion about human beings so my question is like, how is that really detached? Well, they don't have they don't have a huge suspicion about human beings so much. Uh, they they just they just talk about human beings as they know them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Muslims are the same way. Muslim historians are the same way when they're not writing about the companions, of the, when they're not writing about the kind of early period of Islam. Mm -hmm. Now, so basically, the summary is is that around the Renaissance or around this 1500 time period, uh, that century, Western intellectuals end up with an identity crisis and a mistrust of not only the past, but authority and in particular religious authority because they found them to be liars. Yeah, so that's another big product of the Protestant Reformation. The, yeah. the, the Protestant Reformation is suddenly you have open and uh, incentivized mistrust of authority, of religious yeah. authority. And uh, what, so then one group that comes, uh, uh, the Quakers in the, the early 1600s, this one, uh, they are the most skeptical of the text of the, the New, New Testament. This is very interesting. They, some of them, uh, not all of them, but some of them write just with almost, uh, I mean, real skepticism about the text. So they say the text is not authentic, it's been doctored. And they say that, look, the real, message of Jesus, the, the real guidance of Jesus is the, the divine light that God casts into your heart, the Christ within. Yeah. So they follow they follow more like the inner Christ than the actual text of the New Testament. So uh, one of the ulama, he wrote uh, a type of letter and advice to, this was interesting, letter of advice to uh, ulama or people in the ummah who are getting older. Now he said that you are like to the, to the, set, to the khalaf, to the next generation, the khalaf and the Older are the Salaf and then the Khalaf. He said, you are the uh, Salaf of a coming Khalaf. So you are the elders. You are as if you're the parents of the next generation. Every generation are the parents of the next generation, right? So he said, now monitor and make sure that the number one thing that they could do is trust you, mm -hmm. right? All right. So th what you're saying that happened in Europe seems to be, it's almost like a, a divorced, uh, the children of a divorce, right where this massive break happens and everyone remembers that year as the year of the divorce everything is now judged now from two years from the divorce three years from the divorce everything's judged by that and then whoever the villain is of the divorce usually um according to one psych uh, report that i read is that usually each parent each a kid 
will, will assign one of the parents as the villain and one as the victim, mm. right? Usually, like, younger kids will make it black and white. That there's one villain, there's one victim. Then the villain, everything about the villain becomes mistrusted if they see it in someone mm. else. Mm -hmm. So let's say someone uh, villainizes the mom, let's say, right? They say the mom was so bad, ruined my dad. He now he has everything about his mom. Let's say if she was into, like, beauty and she was into whatever... Pilates, it, Pilates. You know, all those things, <laughs> right? <laughs> they actually start to mistrust anyone who has those qualities, right, right. right? So what you're saying is actually seems like a very, but this is at the at the civilizational level. So that really starts in the, you see this very clearly in the 1700s. Someone like Voltaire died yeah. in 1778. Mm -hmm. This guy's hatred for the Catholic Church was just epic. I mean, it made him... Mad funny though. <laughs> I mean, he, he would just... Yeah. Like he would praise Islam and praise Jews, who, groups he didn't he didn't like Jews at all, for example. But he would praise whoever, if it helped him make the Catholic Church look bad, wow. right? So he was just so for example, a lot of his anti-slavery discussions are not because he thought slavery was was wrong inherently. It's because he the, the Catholic the church. church was supporting yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, that's definitely true, and you see, I mean, I, there's like a lot of anti-clericalism in the the emergence of a modern view of the world. No, you know how uh, we have the hadith that uh, you're going to copy the people who go uh, who preceded you, and you're going to copy them, even if they go down a lizard hole, meaning the smallest detail, right? Now, what about the most massive uh, things, which are your way of thinking, your way of viewing the world, your way of viewing your imams, your way of viewing your past, right? So. We are now, and you're noticing this in academia, we now have a lot of Muslims who actually do, their minds have adopted this framework of mistrust of the past. All right, we're in a modern time, so we have an identity crisis, like we're not connected to the past, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they, they were just guys, just like we're guys, hungry to, to succeed, whatever, right? And so they've taken this on, and it's now is in the Arab world too. Yeah. Right? It's not just in the West. It's in the Arab world too. Egyptians have this, right? You see writers who have this, who now view the prophet's generation, alayhi salatu wa sallam, and the Sahab and the next two and the next three, uh, three first three generations, in the same way that you have now the Renaissance and Reformation and Protestant Reformation and all these guys viewing and trying to tear down, like we need to tear it down, right? Yeah. That, uh, that idea... You see this now in Muslim intellectuals. There's a book that came out in uh, 1958 um, called um, Adwa ala al Muhammadiya by Muhammad Abu Rayya, mm -hmm. who died around 1970. And uh, he was a student of Rashid Ridha. Mm -hmm. And uh, that book is like the most uh, comprehensive it? and aggressive attack on the Hadith tradition. And it's offensive too. And you say something like these old men with these big hats and turbans. Yeah, and I mean, he's mocking he's, he's them. A, he's and he just a, calls Muhammad, right? He just says Muhammad. I can't remember. Oh, no, that. the other one. The, no, what I'm talking about is a, a book named um, Muhammad, uh, something like Muhammad, another man. Right. Yeah. And it's tearing down everything that relates to so this, the sanctity so of the So this, this book, Adu al Sunnah Muhammad, isn't, isn't necessarily, it's not irreverent mm -hmm. it's basically you can imagine kind of a neo mortezalite yeah uh, but the point is he's his criticisms are very much the type of criticism of a western historian you know he says the companions are like any other people mm -hmm. right? um you know they were selfish and censored and, and, and you know self-involved and wanted to advance their own interests and unreliable uh but by the way another thing i forgot to mention uh is another uh, element of the Greco-Roman heritage that is revived. There's two things. Is uh, one is skepticism, literally a philosoph philosophy called skepticism, which yeah. is they got from a scholar named Sext Sextus Empiricus, mm -hmm. who lived died around 200 A.D. And uh, a lot of the idea that human beings cannot. So skeptics were uh, they believed that. Uh, right and wrong absolute right and wrong absolute truth was just simply unknowable it was unknowable in fact even sense perception was not really reliable and they used the example of a stick you know when you put it in the water and you look at the stick, it appears to bend yeah. mm -hmm. um, which of course it's not really bent so how how can we really even trust sense perception so what they said is look um right and wrong can't really know about uh so basically just behave according to the custom of the city you live in that's yeah. right and wrong and that has a big impact on 
Europe, Western Europe after the 1500s because this idea of, for, you know, let's not talk about God anymore. Let's not talk about metaphysics anymore. Let's not talk about reality. Anymore. Let's just study the world around us. Um, what's going to matter is our is our customs, our morals, and and we're going to do science. Now, science isn't going to mean the pursuit of knowledge in the metaphysical sense, in the ultimate sense. It's going to be the pursuit of knowledge in the mater material, empirical Power. sense around Control us. of science? Yeah. Control yeah. Of, of... And so nature. then th this idea, there's another, if you've read this book, uh, it's called in Latin, De Rerum Natura. It's been translated in numerous times by a guy named Lucretius. He died, I think, around I don't know, 20 or 17 BC. Fascinating guy, fascinating guy. Actually, Marx's dissertation was uh, um, Karl Marx's dissertation was on Lucretius. Mm. Wait, is he a materialist? He is like, the materialist. Oh, yeah. He's mm. the like the the chief materialist. I told you that's our philosopher right there. No. So <laughs> this, this guy is uh, yeah. So Lucretius. I mean, for him, you know, there's nothing. Nothing exists but the material world. The gods are just people that are like bigger and stronger and longer lasting than us. Um, it's not Zeus making the thunder. It's 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 just lightning in the sky and all this stuff like that. So this also just the idea that, that look the only thing around you is the material world. You want to study something, study the material world. Then they just rediscover. They're at the same time they're rediscovering the science of Aristotle, not not in the the biology, not what we yeah. not what this, you know, natural science yeah. or sorry natural philosophy, which is what we call science. Yeah. You know the hard sciences. And so they start they start in the in cities like Padua in the 1400s, 1500s. They start doing like okay let's come up with a theory and then we do an experiment we get a result so they actually start developing the scientific method by taking aristotle's scientific writing not his philosophical writing not his metaphysical writing and then this by the 1700s this so what's interesting in the 1600s like the biggest scientists in the western tradition people like um uh Allah Muhammad, uh pascal blaise pascal died mm -hmm. in 1662. these they're in the 1600s there are no major scientists who are not committed Christians. The, and, and I mean, I mean like the, the scientists who we respect, like right. today, you know, Boyle, Pascal, all, you too. know, all these guys. Well, Newton's an interesting guy. He's a little bit later. He's like, has, he, he's a, he's a, he believes in God, but he's like a Unitarian. He doesn't believe in the Trinity. But the point is these guys, Pascal was like super, you know these, you know the, like the Daisy doctors who are <laughs> like they're like, like they they're like the leading scholar in their f like biological field, yeah. but then they like also believe the Earth is flat or something like that. Yeah. Like I'm not, uh, I'm not. That's an extreme case. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm just. My point is like you meet, you meet these people and you're like, Subhanallah, these guys are. I'm really happy that they their iman is so strong and they're so into their scientific field. And they, they don't perceive any. Same thing with Blaise Pascal. He was he was so fideistic in his re religious belief in his christian belief like he was like he would today people would be like this guy is like a flat earther almost like that's right. how yeah. fide like faith-based he was but what he, he what he was doing is he's like look in order to protect christianity you have to take it completely out of the realm of reason you do not discuss it about with reason at all and then he goes and just does some serious hardcore experimentation on the natural world sure i mean there's a guy um at i think it's some university in the south who's a young earth creationist and he's also a physicist yeah i mean oh, wow. you know but if you imagine but imagine <laughs> that guy is be is is like the leading guy, physicist yeah. you know yeah. like developed physics so yeah. the point is that there's a there's a way to be a materialist in the sense that it, when we talk i talked about this idea that you know skepticism leads western scholars to kind of start to focus on this what this world and empirical sure. observation only and not yeah. think about metaphysics that that can be done respectfully right so you can say look we can study this stuff and we can think let's not think about that stuff right now or let's not think about it at all but we can still respect it and we're not going to be snarky yeah. about it mm -hmm. but what happens in the 1700s you start getting this really crass materialism this idea that not only is the metaphysical world unknowable but it's it's just contemptible and so you just have contempt for it and would would in your analysis, what do you think is that led to that specifically in Europe? I think um, it just my own kind of amateur idea would be because um, I think that it was associated with the Catholic Church. You yeah. know, it was associated because in America with you didn't get it that strongly. No, I don't think so. A lot of these a lot of these trends took a lot longer to get to uh, the U.S. and to Scotland, two places where they where there was more of a kind of like a religious strong like. Mm -hmm evangelical protestant religious force sure. i remember by the way like all these you know all our beloved fellow americans in texas who are 
in the South who have strong religious beliefs. These guys are all like descendants of Scottish Presbyterians, you know. <laughs> like first, all these like Norwegians and Germans went and settled down there, and they're all like mellow and drinking beer and stuff. And the hardcore Scottish Presbyterians, like my ancestors, went down there and were like, "You guys need to shape up." So that that mean that, that that's a, I think the you it's it's less forceful in in U.S. because you don't have this the the historical legacy of the Catholic Church. I, people have anti-clericalism in Europe and anti-religion in Europe are um, uh, significantly linked to historical animosity yeah. to the Catholic Church. But then once uh, once the philosophy did get to Scotland, I mean, they produced some of the, the biggest like atheistic skeptic philosophers. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, in the 18th and, century. Yeah, and just sort of like, you know, dismantled philosophy after that. Like, like Kant was responding, like Kant was dealing with this problem of like, how do we protect faith, but also do science? It yeah, trying to resolve. This. So I mean, of course, yeah, definitely there were yeah. like Hutchison and Hume and Thomas Reed and people like yeah. that. There was a lot of the, the kind of Scottish Enlightenment in the 1700s. They were, these people were pretty skeptical, but uh, they're you know they, they don't represent the religious uh, el element of that national personality. Sure. So then um, I can't remember what we were talking about, but I think I think we got uh, I think I covered pretty much everything but the story the, yeah. the, the origin of the I mean and then of course this all kind of comes together in the 1600s I mean a big so uh, an important an important I just wanted to add one thing which is an important conclusion that's come to kind of through all these things we put together in the, in by the 1600s is the idea that the Bible is not God it's not like the court you know it's not like God drops this book boom on history and it's like this is the truth. This is sure. God's truth. They realize this is one, the product of history. It's been changed a lot. It's not necessarily reliable. It's not even necessarily the story of all of humanity. It's this really particular story. So I have a question then. It, hang on one second. So it becomes no. like, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Go ahead. It's, it's, it becomes, it's not the truth. It's an example of, it's useful. It's wonderful. It's inspirational, but it's not the truth. The truth is known through reason. Mm. Uh, and through kind of basic common sense. And the Bible was a book for a certain time. And we need to read it now as not as it's speaking to us, but as it was speaking to those people back then. Now, uh, not, none of us here are psychiatrists but, or psychologists, but maybe we know that someone here knows how to, when someone comes out of a divorce and they have that type of, we call it an Arabic aqda, mm. right? Someone who's just got a, um, issues, an issue right with a specific issue because of a complex, a complex yeah, because of a traumatic situation and it is traumatic when you discover that you, the the founders of your civilization were, were liars right you have a well problem. they weren't liars they just well, were they the, were the, just you, they were, you mentioned the foundations the, fraud. the, the you foundations fraud. are unru what you mentioned that that the uh, donation of Constantine was a fraud okay yeah okay fraudulent, fine that right? that was fraudulent how but about I mean, the trinity verse can can you imagine can you imagine this the discovery that the Kava was actually not in Mecca, supposed to be in Jeddah, right? And that Surah Al Ikhwan. Somebody make an argument for that? No, just like, imagine. Okay. Well, though th they will because they no, copy. Yeah, Yehuda, Yehuda Nevo, this Israeli archaeologist, he code. made an argument that yeah, yeah. that the Kava was originally in the Negev Desert. Yeah. And then secondly, imagine if uh, we discover something like Surah Al Ikhlas, which of this Tawheed on like a thousand verses, but uh, just hi hypothetically, is fraud. Okay, but you know, yeah, but you're, you're but just uh, imagine that you're onto something, Shadi. Yeah. Sorry, Doctor Shadi. By uh -huh. the way, you know when I talk on my phone, I say call Shadi Al Masri. He says calling Shady Al Masri. <laughs> <laughs> Shady Al Masri. <laughs> so the but you're onto something there because what do not only people have issues that guy who's you know the kid who's born from the divorce or whatever yeah. comes out of the divorce, he treats other people the same way. Right, so you start. You like you assume all other families got this problem. Yeah. All other women have this problem. All other men yeah. have this problem. So what? Do, what do Westerns? This is the whole, whole point of my chapter. Yeah. What do Western scholars do when they start studying Islamic history? They're like, Judith we know how religions work. We know yep. how scripture works. So yep. this must be the way it works for everybody else. Exactly. And so we got to go and explain to these Muslims who just don't. You know, they're they're these poor people. They're brown. They don't know what's going on. They're all dirty. <laughs> you know, we need to explain to them. We need to send like the white yeah. savior is going to come in and he's going to explain to you what your religion really was. And so yeah. that's to this, to this day, you know, almost it's like every six months, every seven months, every eight months, every year or something yeah. like that. There'll be an article in some newspaper, major Western newspaper. Uh, 
Thirty Mus- percent chance is the Atlantic. Yeah, maybe Muslims. 60%. Muslims have <laughs> Muslims are now questioning these yeah, things. Muslims yeah. are now questioning this scripture. Muslims are now and they should be patted on the back. Yeah, and they're like, hey, you guys are finally yeah. getting it. You yeah. guys are finally getting it. You know. And then of course they get upset when like those guys go like, I'm gonna go drive my car into a bunch of people because I read a Quranic verse that tells yeah. me like they're like, why doesn't someone tell this guy what to do? Like, you <laughs> first you want us to question authority. Yeah. Then you oh, want well. authority to tell people what to do. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. I I think from a uh, from a um, academic level um, there is that sense of complex there is that sense of skepticism but I think when you look further down like at, at a practical level the average person doesn't really think about it this way they just now adopt this idea of it's the spirit of the law it's not the actual let's follow the law it's about yeah. it's about just you know how we feel about something how we believe in something and I think that's probably starting to seep into Islam as well where people are like do you really need to care about praying five times a day versus what type of meat you eat. And and I think the cause of that is a actual literal lack of trust. And yeah. when Allah says X, Y, and Z, that it is God who said X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And he means it. Yeah. Right. And I think that's where, you know, we as Muslims really need to be very, very well, well versed to, to kind of address this because it's going to impact, you know, to further, further generations down the line, it's going to get bigger and bigger, like we've seen it in, in other religions. Well, the, here's yeah. the thing: just uh, we were ta- what we talked about the other day, age of apostasy, right? Yeah. Well, where did this, all of this stuff, and this mistrust, and this divorce from the past, and tear down everything, and we can't trust any of that, and now they have all these complexes? Well, where has it led us to? Like, what kind of world are we living in today? Like nihilism and all these things. And well, if we're following in that framework and view of our setup right then we're going to have a bulk of people anyone who adopts that will end up and they will take many people with them right also on the way out right out of islam because once you break that trust right it's just a matter of time and many times like a woman if she discovers that her husband cheated on her let's say right she may live with him for another decade but it's not going to be the same and it's just a matter of time where the circumstances change. Like, okay, the kids graduated. Now that crack, which she tried to hold in, right? Now that the kids are no longer dependent upon the two, that thing just burst, bursts open, yeah. right? And it's the same way. That crack is the ma- lack of trust of the sources. And that's why that the, the concept of uh, uh, studying Hadith and comparing it to how the Westerners, modern Westerners have, you know what what's the assumptions in their history because of their trauma right uh is, is critical it's important for people to understand why you shouldn't have that type of uh skepticism towards your past yeah, and i think that's one of the that's reasons the idea. Uh, dr brown's work is so is so important to, it's totally to, critical to the western muslim to, to the muslim world generally is because like we can do it from you can go to the masjid and you can have someone who's very eloquent and who's your, the imam of your masjid and explains to you why you should have reverence for these people and why you should just trust that yeah. what's in the sahihain mm-hmm. is legitimate and yeah. it can be but these kids are going to college and they're getting sophisticated arguments countering that and your imam might be a guy that you really like and you really trust but he might not be able to counter those exactly. whereas something like what Dr. Brown is doing in his work and, can serve and, that purpose and, and here's the thing what we're talking about here Nazmo could you go tell him to be quiet down yeah, these guys you, are going, they're going to town upstairs. You, you look pretty scary, so you, you go back down. <laughs> don't, don't smile. smile. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this is a mega, I don't know what they call it. This is a mega framework. This is a framework so big, right, that people do not understand that they're in it. Right. Like, we're, what, what galaxy are we in? We're in the Milky Way, right? Oh, well, there's probably, at some point, they'll discover that the Milky Way is in something, too, right? And then that is in, in the universe, right? And we don't even know uh, uh, that, right? So how do you even explain, just to explain this idea? So that little story that you just told in that period, which we're going to cut out as a snippet, right? Yeah. Of these three factors that cause a massive mistrust of authority in general, but religious authority, right? And here you have people f- f- issuing these fraudulent document documents, fraudulent verses, but they're dressed in the cloth. Mm-hmm right yeah. so it's worse it's not even a guy said uh, he, he's a gangster well i i never proclaimed to be good right you know some people are like that oh, trump he got in because of that he was i never said i was good right <laughs> <laughs> i was always been a dirtbag right <laughs> but here's someone proclaiming to be right that and we've had s- small little versions of that 
in our micro ummah in the West, which is very dangerous and scary, of imams, you could say that people throwing, casting doubt on them. And maybe they're guilty, and maybe they're somewhat guilty. Maybe they're just misbehaved a little bit. Maybe they're somewhat yeah. immature, well, and maybe they're totally guilty. Th there's a special right? thing in Islam, right? So, like, even if you look in all the ulama in your area are corrupt, yeah, for which could be possible. That doesn't mean that you can then apply that retroactively to the period of the exactly. salaf, right? Exactly. And th that reverence has to come from somewhere, right? And it, it can come from just somebody telling you, no, these people were different. They yeah. were unique. Or it can come from somebody taking the approach that, that uh, Dr. Brown's work takes, which is you look at it and you go, no, look, look at the work that they actually put in and recording these ahadith. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Look at the way that they, that they the care that they took to, to ensure that false narrations were out, that questionable narrations were out. Which is, which is why I thought of bringing up the point of when you have that kid from that divorce, that is that analogy that we gave, how do the psychologists, psychiatrists talk to them and say, not all women are bad, not all men are bad, right? Because of their, what they associated with their trauma, right? How does, how is that, and can it be resolved by talking or does it have to be resolved by experience? Mm -hmm. I right. Think, uh, I don't think it has to be resolved yeah. by experience. Yeah. It's it's definitely resolved by experience because, I mean, Dr. Brown, uh, the reason I like your work so much, right? I'm misquoting Muhammad, um, tell us some. Before before that reading that book, um, like I just generally had a suspicion of the Islamic tradition. Like I said I was a Muslim, right? But I it was do, in your mega framework, right? It was in my framework because I spent most meta narrative. Yeah, yeah. I spent most of my high school days debating atheists on YouTube. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and also Christians too. So, uh, waste of time, obviously. But it's not a waste of time at all, man. You <laughs> learn from you learn from experience. Yeah, it could be like, dangerous too. For it could be dangerous. Matters. Very yeah. dangerous. Very Separate dangerous. Topic. Yeah. So, but after you know, after reading that book, I realized that a lot of my troubles was because there was such a huge historical gap between, like me and the society of the Prophet Like, oh, so, so. like I couldn't imagine somebody not living in, let's say, the 20th century. Like yeah. I didn't know what that was like. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And the other thing was, like, I would hear these stories of, you know, this person memorized two hundred thousand hadith, and uh, like, I'll be impressed by it, but I was like, eh, is, yeah. it, is it really true? Yeah. And then I met somebody, one of my teachers, right? Uh, he studied thirteen years in Medina, and he's memorized, you know, um, Ibn Hajar's book, mm -hmm. the Fath al Bari. Yeah, uh, not Fath al Bari. al Maram. Bulugh al Maram. Yeah. And then I just, when he said that, like, he didn't say it. Like, I heard somebody say that he memorized it and I asked him he's like yeah and I just my mouth just yeah. fell open yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, that's like a prerequisite yeah, to that, get into some yeah, schools yeah, yeah, by the that's way that's what I mean about what yeah. you know when we we have a today in an urban and western world we have a very specific idea of what's possible what's not possible right. yeah. like, that's impossible yeah. if you go I mean that's why I think it's really <laughs> interesting when I tell my students about just Muslims mm -hmm. memorizing the Quran mm -hmm. they're like that's not possible like yeah, yeah, you kids memorize regular kids like someone in this class memorized the entire Quran word for word, yeah. word for word, yeah. and then I I was the same way with you. I'd be like this is two thousand one hundred, two hundred thousand yeah, hadiths, exactly. whatever. You can't remember. And then people you meet people and they're like you ask them where's this hadith? They say it's in this book narrated by this is now. Yeah, it's in this yeah, book yeah. narrated by this is now. Yeah. And then by the way, you look at the early the let's say Ibn Hajar or Ibn Adi in the nine hundreds or any of these people. How are they writing their books? Like they didn't have databases. They didn't yeah. have even. In, they didn't even have indexes. It's just insane. Yeah. They were br their brains were just uh, computers. Well, you know the analogy that I always bring up to people when they talk about memorization and stuff. Uh, listen to sports radio. Those guys have statistics from the '60s, <laughs> right? '70s, and and when they're talking, you know that they're not pulling it up on the computer right away. Yeah. Like today's statistic, he's pulling up, right? Mm -hmm. But when he's comparing today's statistics to like what Roger Staubach did in whatever century, decade he was playing, whatever, right? I mean, these guys are also, yeah. these sports uh, radio hosts, they're like viewed by society as these meatheads, but they're very skilled in certain things. They we, have have, we have to have a hips off, hips <laughs> off between the sports radio guys and the yeah. there's a there's a There's a certain capacity, um, and I see men focusing more on this kind of stuff where you, you find this area of interest and you zoom in on it, right? And then you you, you just start drilling down, and you memorize and you learn oh everything. Gosh, like yeah. there's people who not invented 
categorized and learned like a language from Star Trek yeah. or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And they know all the facts that Imaginative, they are to know. They know uh, yeah. the they know like the serial numbers on ships in the yeah. show, and it's it's just a thing. It's just like this obsessive quality that, and yeah. it's mostly males that I've that I've observed in whether it's sports, whether yeah. it's religion, obsessive. Like, and uh, alhamdulillah, it serves a good purpose when you do it for a religious purpose, right? And, and uh, if you ever talk to anyone who's lived in the Shinqit and tell you about life there, so life there. Um, we know it's hot in the day. It's Mauritania. Mauritania. Yeah. And they're studying all day. Now, the evening time, if someone comes back from the marketplace with uh, tea, he said, they used to tell me that the evening time was that they would make the tea, and the, their method of making the tea is really heavy, and they keep uh, pouring it back into the boiler. They, put, they, uh, they pour it into the cup, then pour it back into the thing to boil a second time, right? So it cools down, then boils. It takes a long time because they have all this time in the world, right. and it's finally cool. And they got the flames on. So what do they do? They sit around and they do al-ghaz, which is fiqh uh, riddles. Like, what happens if this happened? What happened if that happened? They would have, um, every Thursday, actually, something that Murabut uh, al-Hajj, rahimahullah, unafa'ana bih, fiddarayn, he used to do with the kids, is he would have a hips competition every Thursday of who could go the longest without a mistake. Mm. Right? <laughs> and they would just sit there. Right? Who could go the longest without a mistake? Right? I think, I think so all day and all night, what other hobby did they have? Nothing except religious texts. Yeah. So the idea that they memorize them is By the way, part, part of the reason that this seems weird to uh, modern Western people is that we don't, we don't even force memorization of like anything in What's school the, anymore. It's not even you used to memorize poetry when yeah. you were a little kid, yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. 50 years ago. That's You're not why, even financially rewarded to memorize yeah, anything. That's why yeah. we're so bad at spousal arguing. You know, imagine like yeah. you're again a fight with your wife and like Shinkleet. Yeah. And you're like, name one time I did that. She's like, oh, okay, okay, you can stop. <laughs> that's funny. Now, so I think we covered the historical part pretty well, right? I'll just mention one other thing. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that student of Rashid Reda's that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Brown, that wrote that book. I, you know, there's, you can make the academic my arguments again. Somebody like that would never have existed in just a few generations earlier, right? Like you have the story in Qadi Ayyad. Uh, you know what would have existed? His janazah. Yeah, because Qadi Ayyad <laughs> relates a, a, a story of a man or an incident of a man who said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he wasn't, yeah. he didn't eat the simple foods that he ate because he, because for, for religious reasons, just that it was more luxurious things weren't available to him. Yeah. And if they he were, he would have. Yeah. Oh, right? okay, yeah. He yeah. would have eaten them. Yeah. And they killed him in Andalus. I'm that was you. it. He was like, <laughs> there's no, there's no like, there's no repentance. There's no opportunity to take it back. Yeah, I'm telling you, we you were talking it. the other day how yesterday we were saying that um, uh, the, the Madakis, they are almost go to the point of being so, like some of the Takfiris, right? But if, if, in fact, look at his, historically, look at their societies, right? Dean-wise. They have these like sort of, it's almost like having military guards around your doctrine, right? That will just off with your head for anything. However, all right, look at the result. You'd ver find, I, I haven't seen a lot of heretical groups like growing in the society. Like there maybe have individuals for sure, right? But growing as like existing normally in the society right mm -hmm. they they had a type of uh pure purity over generations in that sp space between andalus and uh, the maghrib and down into africa that should be something that we consider like a massive accomplishment and we should actually doc it should be like you could probably look at these things and you, maybe you can tell me if i'm wrong but that that they, they were so serious about these issues but that look at the result you got results right yeah. Even like they're weird, they're kind of murabit, uh, not murabit, but the al muahidun mm -hmm. al-Mawahid movement. Yeah. That was inspired by the Ibn Tumar. He went to the east. He went, he went to, the to the east and got corrupted yeah. in the east. Right. Yeah, he came back. He yeah. came Interesting back. Interesting point. Yeah. So, uh, but also look at um, what's said about them. Right. Mm -hmm. It said that Asham mahalul anbiya, wal maghrib mahalul awliya. Right. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when your aqid is pure. Then Allah loves you, right? Then your ibad, when you ibad, add ibadah to that, right? Then the ingredients of wilaya are right there, Amen. and they and they look at the the wilaya of the maghrib. It's unbelievable. The people I attribute mean, it wanna, to be considered if, the awliya. If you want like a simple visual proof, the Eastern Malikis pray with their arms folded. Yeah, like come on, oh, really? <laughs> they do. <laughs> what is there, there are Eastern Malikis. You know yeah. that Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Arabi was one of the people who went against the grain. He felt that the Malikis are too tight, and he went against them on a number of issues. 
One of them was the hands. So right? he said uh, qab? Qab. He said, but he said uh, like something that, that his aunts or his, the, the common Muslims in his family told him to stop this. It's not good. Right. He said, well, the evidence. He said, but they said it's not good. He said, well, I have the evidence. Right. And they would they didn't know how to. They just said it doesn't feel right. Right. <laughs> so he said then uh, Allah proved them right one time when I was taking a, a little ferry across the ocean to come down to the Maghrib. Right. And one man saw me in the cabin. Right. Praying with Qabd. He gathered the boat and he said, we have an eastern spy amongst us. <laughs> <laughs> and he was held, oh interrogated, right? And they were going to throw him into the water for Khiana. He said, then I realized my aunt and my mom were right. <laughs> but See, the, I, I have a question. Go yeah, ahead. I was just going to say one thing. I was uh, One more thing I was going to say um, uh, about this was, um, I actually forgot what I was going to say. So anyway, you make your point. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, I remember what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in his rookie year, so he could be interrupted. Yeah, yeah. So what I was to say is that the only thing, the one thing that the uh, uh, the Madikis had was they had a wall against um, uh, a lot of the things that the Sufis did, and they were the last people to admit and allow for many of the things that the Sufis did, right? The gatherings and festivals and whatnot. They put up a wall. They didn't like it. They didn't want it, right? It came in. What well, came into the, all the ummas? They yeah. and she realized like we actually need this. The times are changing. We need to do this, yeah. to, to expand these things a little bit. So uh, it, they came. In, it came in the Shafi countries first because Imam Shafi's definition of bid'ah was so vast. Right. Like I mean, uh, uh, he, he was more flexible on mm -hmm. his definition of bid'ah. Came into the Madikis last. Okay. Uh, the Hanbalis should know that it came to them first. They have more <laughs> Sufi Hanbalis before there were Sufi Madikis, right? Even right? That one, right? Yeah. yeah. So they didn't take me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But actual legitimate, actual Turok with with bayas and gatherings and everything. Yeah. But and then when it came to the to into the Madikis, right? The one thing that they can be criticized for is that at some point it did go haywire and they did have goofs, yeah. right? Goofia. But goofia. But then eventually they reached a happy medium. Right, mm -hmm. where they were strong on on certain things, and they and they you could count uh, this is okay, this is okay, this is okay, uh, from the from the, their hardcore ulama, such as like Qadi Ayyad, mm -hmm. right? But you see, things. even Sheikh uh, Ahmed Zarouk, uh, mm -hmm. Allah, 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 his, Allah. he's very skeptical of yeah. uh, visitation yeah. and graves and things. Yeah, yeah. And he, doesn't so like yeah he doesn't like the excesses. Yeah, he doesn't like the Yeah, he doesn't like excesses. Let's see. Okay, Nazmul, now you could talk. So I I just want to be contrarian yeah. here, okay, because. <laughs> um, throw in some disagreement so this idea of questioning authority and being suspicious of the islamic tradition and so on i mean i not that i hold this opinion asking for a friend um <laughs> is, like aren't some of those says points... every single person who has a question my, my friend is a rash my friend has like a rash <laughs> <laughs> sorry that joke. That joke. Uh, okay so like aren't some of these things from the enlightenment aren't they good points in terms of, you know, like, you should look at if texts have been doctored, you shouldn't uh, just blindly accept uh, an authority figure just because, you know, they say I'm an authority figure and they can't provide an argument. That's 100% true, of course. And I, guess yeah. guess who is always very firm on these points? Muslims. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. like, yeah. right, right, right. I mean, that, the, you know... Uh, I, Which like, is hadith criticism. Yeah, I mean, that's right. what the, these guys, like, when you look at the, even the study of manuscripts, I mean... When you look, let's just, just look at the study of Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari. I mean, the, uh, within, um, you know, 50, 60 years of his, of his death, there's already people trying to get different riwayat, different narrations of his book to like, okay, what's, what's the most reliable version? And then every couple hundred years, you have something like a big figure, you know, uh, Abu Dhar al-Harawi, al-Yunini, al-Qastalani, uh, um, uh, Allahumma Sayyid Sayyid Muhammad, um, uh, I mean, you have this uh, obsession with checking mm. all the different variations of the readings of the of the of the Sahih, and then there's a. I remember I wrote I mentioned this in one of the articles I wrote, uh, like um, I think on Medina Institute, but you know uh, these scholars like Al Maqari and these scholars of the Maghrib in the 1500s, 1600s, they say things like you know these books, these shuruh, these hand, these these Maliki shuruh books, there's they're starting to um, some of the stuff is like opinions or marginal notes are starting to get uh, incorporated into the main text. Like some guy is writing some non nonsense on the margin, 
and that's getting incorporated into, as like a thick opinion of something mm. into the main. And he said, now like, these these texts you can't rely. This book can't rely on. This book you can't rely on. So there, there. This, uh, I mean, even like half of the Thehabi, you see these guys. He went. He got the 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 edition, the 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 the, 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 the manuscript of Tariq Baghdad, written in the hand of Khatib Baghdadi, so in the hand of the author, right? So, so they were obsessive. I mean, yeah. they were obsessive. You're 100 percent right about everything you just said, but the idea that um, that that's actually uh, something Muslims have always had. See, yeah. um, sorry. Yeah, see, but my, uh, I was reading your book uh, on Hadith, but like at the same time, there are these histories with like crazy stuff in them, like even Tariq Baghdad and all these other books with like crazy narrations and, you know, they would collect like these. Weak That's things. you're coming from a Hanafi perspective, right? Because they don't like that book. <laughs> no, yeah. but they, but they would. Yeah. But you know what? This, this is so this is something that, you know, I, I agree with you 100 percent. I've written about this. I think it's a big kind of in, internal inconsistency. Mm -hmm. In Muslim thought, which is, the, and if you went to Khatib Baghdadi or any of these guys, or, or, or Ibn Manda or Abu Naim al Isbahani or mm -hmm. Ibn Asak, and you ask them, like, is this story true? They'd be like, no, it's not true. So oh, why is it in your book? So they, but they allowed those things for insignificant stories, mm -hmm. but, like but the history stories, uh, color, to color it up, yeah. right? But it, but to then you you start getting like enough of that material yeah. Yeah. and people start losing capacity yeah. to, to really discern truth from falsehood. Mm -hmm. And that's why people like Ibn al Jawzi, you have the book on your library upstairs, that's what, Tablis Iblis, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Or Ibn Hajar, or even an Imam Muslim, right? Why does he write his Sahih? He says, I go around the mosque, I hear people mm -hmm. narrating stuff, they know he's not reliable. Yeah. They're Athim they are yeah. mm -hmm. They are sinning and cheating people when they narrate this material. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a minority opinion which is held by some of the biggest scholars in Islamic history throughout all the way up until like Al Albani today or you know in the modern period which is like no look you have a method for sorting out reliable from unreliable material Observe. why do you then go and use the unreliable yeah, material exactly. and one to of the color reasons, it up i mean one of the reasons like you know we we all do this right you know i tell we tell a story and spice we, know, it up. we know it's not true but yeah. we do this all the time or we yeah. tell a version of a story that's a, that's a little bit different than what actually happened but it mm -hmm. communicates it better but then there can be less uh you know it can be less um noble and we've all we've all done this thing where you know you know, we read like uh, an article or we hear someone says, did you hear so-and-so said this? And then I, I tell Nazim, so-and-so said this and who told you this? Oh, I, I mean, did you hear him say that? No, I didn't hear him say that. I mean, I, Shad yeah. told me. And then God knows where this stuff came from. And they're written, yeah. but we all like, and so that uh, we all kind of uh, un unintentionally yeah. spread yeah. falsehoods. Yeah. See, my, my biggest concern with that is, I mean, my experience debating with Christians is, I mean, they will, I mean, it's a very difficult point to defend in a debate because they'll be like, oh, look at this outrageous story. It's earlier, therefore it's it's authentic. Right? That's not true at all. Exactly. First of all, you know, there's some, I mean, there's some stories in them like Maghazi. Like, for example, yeah, right. this idea that, um, I mean, this is this is the craziest <laughs> thing. So oh, a couple of things, like one in, in I think it's Maghazi al-Waqadi. Yeah. That, uh, that, uh, the, the prophet they saw something when they capture Taif he orders he says okay, go to this other Kaaba where there's this uh, like Izza or Malat or Elizza or Uzza he says go and uh, destroy he tells Khalid ibn go destroy yeah. this he goes he like chops it you know hits it with a sword or something comes back Prophet's like you know, he didn't destroy it go back he goes up and it comes alive as this woman with a crazy hair and attacks him with a sword. I heard that one. Yeah. So I was like, okay, first of all, <laughs> <laughs> I thought idols, they, they can't help you, they can't hurt you, right? They can't, def they, they can't even defend themselves against a fly. Yeah. You know, this is like all Quranic. So if the, if the idea is like, this has to be true because why would a Muslim invent it? You, you don't think it's true, do you, historian? No, of course it's not true. Idols don't come to life. But it's like somebody made this up and it, supposedly Muslims don't invent this stuff because they believe in idols don't do anything. So most, there's other story in the, in the Sira Ibn, Ibn Ishaq. It's the weird, like it's Salman al Farisi. It only appears in this source. Salman al Farisi is telling the story of how he became Muslim. He's coming from Persia, he wanders around seeking the true religion. Eventually some guy says, go to this, the desert in Syria. And there's this bushes, there's two bushes. And there's a wise man who lives in the bushes. And every year he goes from one bush to the other bush. And you got to catch him during that time and ask him about the true religion. And he goes, the guy finds a wise man. The wise man runs between one bush and the other, gets him. Where's the true religion? He says, okay, go to Medina. The prophet's coming there. And then the prophet allegedly says to him, do you know who that was? 
He says that was Jesus. Oh, wow. So, okay, so ha- who, like, you know, nobody, I'm, Christians, Muslims, nobody believes Jesus is living in a bush in like 600 AD, <laughs> you know? So, a uh, bush in Syria. Yeah. So this is, you know, again, this is in the Syria of Ibn Ishaq. And I'll be like, yes, that story is made up. And it has a totally unreliable listenad, by the way. Okay, so the point is that um, but people that, make up stories for all sorts of weird reasons. Yeah. But the unreliable listenad is pointed out, right? He doesn't know. Ibn Ishaq doesn't point it out. But his peers pointed out. I mean, w- his peers, we don't, I mean, his I peers criticize it. I've never seen that story criticized. But How about that, the Khalid bin Walid story? Have you seen that gets, criticized? That stuff gets cut out of... Uh, Ibn Ibn Ishaq Sirah by Ibn Hisham. Yeah. Ibn Hisham, that's the stuff that he cuts out, like the satanic mm. verses story and yeah. all this stuff. Which he was cut, from Waqidi. That's in Ibn Ishaq too. Mm. He cuts this stuff out. But I think to your point about discussing this with um, non Muslims or Christians, I actually have found it to be an area we shine. Because if you look at everything that's core to practicing our religion, mm-hmm. our process around that is, is, is not even close. To say second to none would be a, an understatement. Like you look at the Quran and how that's been transmitted down. You yeah. look at like Imam Bukhari's hadith, which has just an amazing process around it. Mm-hmm. It gives us everything we need to practice. A lot of these outside things that are clearly made up, it, it doesn't impact it our doesn't day-to-day touch day to day practice. Of and the not religion. only not only that, we and do the, just the fact that we have a discussion around it. Here you have Ibn Hisham, the student, already checking the teacher. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 and the I've original seen, university student. I've, I've, <laughs> I've seen a convert in Australia convert purely based on the process mm. that, that Islam took, yeah. that the Muslims take to, 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 to preserve the, the deen. It, but amazing. another thing that's really important is at pr- exactly what you're saying, which is one of the earliest policies that we can we find in books, like as far back as we have books of you know, hadith, is the statement of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and all these other figures from his time onward, which is... Uh, Hadiths that deal with halal haram, hadiths that deal with ahkam, we're very strict on. Hadiths that deal with manners, the virtues of people, uh, what happened at the beginning of the world, what happened at the end of the world. That stuff, they said, we're lax on this. Because yeah. they, they, they said, these are not the core areas. The core areas of religion are ahkam, law, and aqidah, belief, yeah. the nature of God. That they were super strict on. Yeah. But everything else, they were like, hmm. You know, and it's kind of ironic because nowadays, if you go, yeah, you go out of the street and you say to someone on the street like religion, they're going to be like Adam and Eve. Religion, they're going to be like apocalypse or yeah, like rapture. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> the, the things that we think we don't when we talk about religion in America today, we don't talk about like how you get married, how you transact yeah. things, yeah. how you pray. Right? I mean, people yeah. are like, why don't you pray? You know? So like the 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 things that today we think of as being the first thing that come into my mind that are, are religion yeah. are the things that Muslim scholars were the least concerned about in terms mm-hmm. of authenticity. Yeah. And, so uh, I know we hear a lot of stories um, of how how strict they were about um, taking hadith from 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 sources. Uh, one of them that that I've heard often is Imam Bukhari. You know, if someone was honest in everything that they did, but he saw him kind of lure over an animal with something but it's just kind of oh lying yeah yeah, yeah that he wouldn't take had, uh, a hadith from from this person or a transmission from this person one is that true uh it was it that strict and two if it is or similar stories like that are true how do we know it's just not folklore how can we say look this is how this is we hmm. were sure as muslims i mean i would that say it was that i would strict. say you don't even need I would say those stories are cute and interesting, but they're kind of irrelevant because you don't even need to, you can see it in the books themselves. So uh, like, I mean, just an example, like Sunan Abu Dawood, he, Abu Dawood has, he's heard a hadith from somebody, but he hasn't, um, he didn't hear it narrated from that guy's book. He wanted the guy to sit and read the book to him instead of just telling him the hadith. So he goes, he finds another person who is that person's student, and he has him read it to him. So the point, he, he says this in his, in his book, like in the course of narrating a hadith. Uh, Bukhari, if you look at his sahih, it's, I mean, it's, it gets to the point of almost absurdity because he, so he'll include multiple, almost always multiple narrations of a hadith. And there will be often no difference between the hadith 
and even no difference in the asnat except, for example, one, like, let's say the asnat is like me to Shadi to Saad, right? So it would be like Saad says, I heard Shadi from Jonathan. Another version would say, uh, I heard Saad, Shadi tell me that Jonathan told him. Mm. So he'll, he'll include a version to make sure that at every link in the asnad, mm. in the chain, there's actually specific statement of the person told me, not from. Because from means like, for example, according to somebody, according yeah. to Martin Luther King. I never met Martin Luther King, right? So, but the point is <laughs> that that's what an, an means according to or yeah. from. So it could mean you met him. It could mean you never met the person. So that's like, and you don't even, he doesn't even specify this as his policy, but you start to realize it. And you yeah. start to write down, like you realize that he's yeah, actually yeah. making sure that for every chain of transmission, there's a, uh, a li there's a direct evidence of direct transmission. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. See, no, my, so, see my, my biggest concern is not with that specific thing, because I think that's uncontested that, you know, the Muslim tradition, uh, you know, they've, they've been aware of the corruption of other religions and that, that sort of mindset of, um, of trying to preserve their own religion comes out of that anxiety of you know losing that authenticity but one of the things that i've noticed at least is that sometimes the authority can be taken to uh, an extreme where your sheikh or whatever you know narrates a story about the beginning of the world that you know the world originated on the back of a tortoise or whatever so, you know stuff in ibn kathir's uh mm -hmm. um and uh, people you know people will be like you know that must be true like it must, you know, we can't. Because the sheikh is so pious. Yeah, isn't exactly. that a Hindu uh, belief? I don't know. I don't know where he got that from. But yeah, that's yeah. Hindu. The back of the tortoise, and your guy gets on the back of the tortoise and gyrates on the tortoise. <laughs> yeah, and there's, a, there's something about a giant bull in. in yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in Kathir But Ibn well. Kathir so, is not gonna. That's Mithra. That's the Mithra bull. Oh. Yeah. Mithra kills this bull, and out of the bull's blood, all the the sun and the moon uh, and everything are born. Yeah. So there you go. So Ibn Kathir is just collecting all kinds of pagan. Uh, See, but like but he, I'm people, sure he's not te passing that off as like truth. No, but but the thing is, is he that just citing a, it? There's a lot of people. I like I'm like from Ibn Kathir has a yeah. lot of Israeli. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, no, yeah. but Ibn Kathir, like he himself, as Doctor uh, Doctor Brown said, would never accept this is like he's just no, this is just, just history, saying. Right? Yeah. Some people but, say, but but Kila. people like I'm from I'm from Bangladesh, yeah. Kila, and they yeah. have they have like a very. Uh, Kila means it was said, and yeah, it was yeah. like just if if you hear a story that's interesting, I don't want you to really believe it, yeah. but let's just say it. Let's let's just say it. You say Kila. It was said. Yeah. Some people said. Yeah. But the thing is that in the public sphere, especially in certain Muslim countries, um, uh, like especially in Bangladesh too, like uh, I'm from Bangladesh, like people will just say the most outrageous things, and they'll just believe it because you know my Sheikh said so. And yeah. So that's a, a that's the branches of goofism. Okay, but yeah, there's, there's a, a spiritual. But, no, you know it's funny because when I was when I was oh, writing right. the misquoting Muhammad book, uh, I'm sorry, Ahmed, I keep cutting you off. No, okay, <laughs> I, I mean, I'll I'll be quiet after this. But the you know the um, uh, like I was writing the book and I was like, you know, I, I kind of want to say that Muslims are more prone to conspiracy theories than Americans. <laughs> Then I was like, you know what? I started thinking about like the whole like Obama's a Muslim stuff, and I, and now for God, there's this like uh, Q. What is this? Uh, yeah, QAnon. QAnon mm -hmm. or whatever. Like you know, I'm like, wait a second, that's not true. Like <laughs> we, we have our own utter nonsense Alex stuff Jones, too. Alex you know what I mean? Like we have the I'm only sorry. the the people who uh, can have conspiracy stories more than anyone else are people who lost, right? So we as a civilization lost. So we need to explain in a way that everything was from the Yahud. Everything was are from the protocols. Are you saying that that's why, you know, regular mainstream Democrats are all believe that everything is a Russian body? Now, now they're <laughs> doing Because they lost that. the election? Well, and it was, it was the uh, Republicans first with Obama. He's a Muslim, etc. And now it's the Democrats and all they're obsessed with is the Russians, right? Because they can't believe they actually legitimately lost, yeah, yeah. right? And Muslims for the last few you know, since uh, I guess the latest version of it was Israel and the Yahud. Before that, I don't know what it was, something else. And then people right? who couldn't get on that moon ride are like, it's never happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, and then it's like, you know, Neil Armstrong became Muslim. Because right. <laughs> he heard the then in space. Yeah. I mean, the 90s were rough for Muslims. Yeah. I, I, believe that. I believe that for a long yeah. period of time. Yeah. Then I actually looked it up and I'm just like, yeah. where's my common sense? Okay, right, now so question for you. You have something to say? No, no, I was gonna, we were going to switch to the next. Okay, story, so before we get to slavery now, tell us, uh, where'd you grow up? Um... I have another question. Interview. Sorry, I have, interview. No, I have another question before. Yeah. But you, but you just like just cut this out. Yeah. Is there any coffee around here, man?